Okay. Um, we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Abjit uh, Patil, he's PhD in um, the Golan Svehadi's lab at the University of Pennsylvania. And his talk today is modeling type one diabetes progression using machine learning and single cell transcriptomic measurements in human eyelids. A little about him, he did his postdoc research in the Vahadi lab in the University of Pennsylvania at the Perelman School of Medicine. His research focused on developing a machine learning approach for early detection of type 1 diabetes using single cell transcriptomic data. He previously completed his PhD in computational science at the University of Texas at El Paso. And his research focus was the development of machine learning algorithms to classify different cancers using high dimensional transcriptomic data accurately. His newest paper um, is modeling T1D progression using um, ML and single cell transcription uh, measurements in human islets, cell reports, medicine, May 2024. And the study establishes a precedent for using ML in early detection of type 1 diabetes. I'm going to drop that paper uh, link into the chat and um, he will take some questions at the end. Welcome, uh, Abjit. Thanks so much for joining us and we're excited about the talk. Thanks so much, Monica. Yeah, as uh, Monica, Monica already mentioned, uh, today I'll be presenting about uh, our new uh, newly published paper, uh, which is uh, modeling type 1 diabetes progression using machine learning and single cell RNA-seq uh, in human islets. So uh, as uh, most of you might already be familiar with this, uh, uh, as the type 1 diabetes disease progression starts, but a beta cell mass uh, starts depleting mm -hmm. uh, with the increase of autoantibody positive uh, autoantibodies, basically. So uh, whatever uh, window of opportunity for us uh, like in early detection is, uh, especially in this area where still there is a chance uh, where people, individuals are having normal blood sugar and uh, the automatic antibodies are like less than or equal to one. Uh, so there are several uh, uh, major constraints uh, in early detection. The first one is the inability to perform uh, safely perform a biopsy uh, from the yeah, living uh, donors uh, from the human uh, pancreas. And uh, as the disease progression uh, begins, the beta cell mass. Uh, destructs uh, by the time and uh, the clinically, I mean, by the time patients are clinically diagnosed. Uh, and most of the, uh, therefore, most of these studies uh, in type 1 diabetes have been performed on uh, peripheral leukocytes from the blood, which may not be the site of uh, pathogenesis. Uh, recently, uh, uh, a lot of uh, research, research has been going on in the islets and uh, especially with the advent of this program, uh, human pancreas analysis program uh, in collaboration with uh, collaborative effort from multiple universities. Uh, uh, for last year, they had like 140 donors and all the data that I'll be presenting today will is coming from this program uh, where they extract uh, the pancreatic islets uh, and sequence the data into different modalities, including single cell RNA-seq and uh, uh, we used uh, that data to um, for our machine learning modeling to uh, identify uh, genes of interest. Abjeet, I have a quick question regarding HPAP, just to qualify. You have um, you just noted that they had 140 donors last year. How long has HPAP been um, going? And is that uh, a yearly amount of donors or is it um, the total to date? Uh, I think HPAP started in 2016, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and uh, yeah, they the 140 was total by March uh, 2023. Uh, if I'm not wrong, probably 40 or 30 do more donors have been added. But most mm -hmm. of these donors come from uh, healthy individuals. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and some recently they have also added type, type 2 diabetic, like uh, year 33 donors. I think this is mostly, uh, this came from 2021 to 2024, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 23. So 140 or 170 donors uh, yeah, over, over eight years have been collected. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Right. Thank you. So the updated information, I think, uh, can be found in the HPAP uh, website, uh, or uh, even there is a website called PangDB where we deposited our uh, islet uh, transcriptomics data. So. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, uh, uh, with the HPAP, uh, we had uh, 50 donors, uh, which comprised of uh, majority of them were controls, like 30 donors and not antibody positive, 10 donors and type 1 diabetic donors, which were nine. So uh, uh, we sequenced the data and then uh, we annotated them. Uh, so once we have the raw sequencing uh, data, we use our pipeline. Uh, of integrating all these samples and then uh, annotate the cell types because these uh, all cells uh, come from myelids, but we don't know which cell type they belong. So we use this semi-supervised machine learning algorithm. Uh, it's called AC sorter to sort the cells into different uh, subpopulations. And um, if we see here uh, in this plot, uh, we have almost around 10 cell types and uh, kind of, uh, bioinformatic validation is uh, we know from the fact that beta cells are less in type 1 diabetic uh, donors. So we see uh, that here in this small uh, yellow uh, color blob, almost 10%. So it's more in diabetic or uh, autoantibody positive, which are not clinically defined as uh, either control or diabetic. Uh, in this group, there is like beta cell mass intact, but uh, the in type 1 diabetic donors, it's uh, too low. And we sort of also uh, validate using the um, feature plots. So for example, we check the marker for SNR and then the glucagon for alpha cells to confirm if our annotations are right. And uh, this, uh, this uh, study was, I mean, uh, this report kind of thing, well, oops. I think my screen was okay. So this uh, study was published in Nature Metabolism last year. Uh, this is the largest available uh, single cell transcriptomic data set uh, uh, in the field as of uh, today. And uh, now the question was, uh, because we had this large uh, data, we wanted to uh, explore uh, if we can use machine learning to identify the significant genes, and if we can classify uh, these donor groups, uh, type 1 diabetic, autoantibody positive, and control. So we use this uh, machine learning approach. Uh, the pipeline looks uh, like this. It's it's quite complicated uh, in terms of uh, explainability, like this, this part. But I'll just quickly uh, briefly go through it. So we have the single cell data. We normalize it, uh, which becomes like a processed uh, object. And then we split the data into 70% uh, training and 30% testing. So 70% training is where uh, uh, that portion of data, uh, for example, in type 1D versus control, we use 70% of the data for training uh, where we find the best model. Um, and then this 30% remaining data will be the cells from this part will be blinded. So we will use only that to test the model. Uh, so how do we test? We use certain metrics called accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity, which evaluates uh, how good the model is performing. And based on that, uh, we also get uh, this, this particular approach, extreme gradient boosting method, which is called XGBoost. It also populates a ranked list of genes. So these genes will be the one, these are kind of markers that differentiate between type 1 diabetic and control. So these markers will be selected in each iteration. And as we know, uh, machine learning could be uh, biased in terms of like what data we feed in and which model we use. So to overcome this uh, kind of replication bias or uh, you know model bias, so we repeat this experiment for 10, 100 times so that uh, the gene list we capture is robust. So uh, we basically get 100 different list of uh, ranked genes uh, iterating through the loop. Uh, ultimately, we take the average, uh, which gene is being picked, let's say 100 times or 90 times. So those are the final list of genes uh, that we select. Uh, we call them like uh, feature, uh, final list of uh, important features or important genes that are used to differentiate um, a type 1 diabetic donor from a control donor or a type 1 diabetic donor with a uh, autoantibody positive donor. So um, we want uh, th this this graph shows the uh, performance of our model uh, where uh, this is in terms of accuracy, sensitivity and specificity. So if we see these uh, in type 1D versus control, it's pretty 
good almost about 95 percent whereas uh, in a b versus control if we see there is like a drop in performance uh, i think this is especially because most of the signatures like the features or genes are similar in autoantibody positive as well as control so uh, there is not much uh, difference so that's why uh, they are like having low performance whereas there is like a huge contrast in the in terms of signatures between type 1d versus control or type 1d versus uh, in a bit like a b that's why we have good performance and then uh, we checked the same thing in different cell types for each of these comparison like type 1d versus control in different cell types uh, what was the accuracy sensitivity and specificity similarly for uh, type 1d versus a b classifier and autoantibody positive uh, with control classifier. Overall, uh, we saw good uh, classification performance uh, in the cells with large number, for example, acinar, alpha cell, beta cell, uh, to some extent ductal cell. Uh, so next, we wanted to see uh, how these features could be used. So as I mentioned previously, along with these uh, uh, performance, we also get like a ranked list of genes. For example, if we use type 1D versus control uh, classifier, along with this matrix, we also get like top features that are used uh, to um, predict the score. So these features or these genes represents uh, the, uh, are the representative uh, unique features or unique markers between those two uh, phenotypes. So when we use those uh, uh, genes of interest, genes of uh, important, important genes, uh, we plugged into the uh, pathway analysis uh, to identify which biological pathways those genes are primarily involved in. And we found, uh, for example, in uh, beta cell of type 1D versus control, uh, this is KET pathway analysis with uh, FDR less than 0.05, we found few top predicted pathways. One of them was type 1D, uh, type 1D uh, mellitus, and then also antigen processing and presentation. So most of the genes that were involved in these pathways were HLA class one proteins, which is HLA A, B, C, and E. So most of the literature, from the literature, we already know this, uh, HLA A, B, C is uh, having high uh, expression in type one diabetes compared to control which we also, these were also predicted by our model. And also uh, we can see here the expression being higher. Um, uh, one, uh, one important finding uh, was HLAE, which is not widely known, although it is known, but it's not widely known uh, in the literature, uh, especially in type 1D uh, space. So uh, this was also predicted by our, mark, uh, our algorithm. So, Just a quick um, question, Abjit, um, Kiati Gerder from Boston. Why, um, why is there a decrease in specificity of immune cells between control versus T1D? And it seems uh, there's an increase in the ductal cell population in the SC data in T1D compared to controls and also in autoantibody. Any comment? Yeah, I think uh, the, yeah, that's, you mean, you are referring to this one. In type 1D versus control, the specificity is uh, low. Feel free. And... Sorry. Specifically in immune cell data, like you mentioned, the order antibody controls has more common genes. That's why you have oh, yeah. specificity in all cells, but what happened in the type 1 diabetes and control? Yes, that's right. So, in general, these islets have, it's very hard to extract immune cells from islet. Uh, uh, tissue. So islet cells in general are having very low number uh, compared to SNR alpha, beta. So that's one point because alpha, beta and uh, SNR cells have too many cells, almost 30,000, 40,000. And with large data uh, for these models, it's uh, quite common to perform better. But with smaller data, let's say in immune cells uh, of islet, immune islet cells, it's usually very low in size almost 700, 500, something like that. Uh, and in, on top of that, in this comparison, autoantibody positive and control comparison, the immune cell population uh, 
although the, these two are like transcriptional similarities are too much where you cannot really make a lot of differentiation between the genes uh, in autoantibody positive group or control group. So it is already difficult for the classifier and uh, with less cells, it is too uh, hard. It was too hard for it. So that's why the specificity and uh, sensitivity is too low. So therefore, I think uh, these results uh, cannot be kind of trusted because if we look at the uh, metric, it's almost below 50%. So uh, most of the things that we got from uh, 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 anything which is above like uh, 80 or 90 could be useful, especially like the all cells or type 1D versus control, especially in these four groups, SNR, alpha, beta, and ductal. So, um, uh, yeah, next, uh, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Any comments on Dr. Uh, in this one? Uh, no, in the SC data, if you go back to the first, like, last slide, next, previous slide. One, okay. one more. Here. The ductal cells are very high in D one D compared to control. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean biologically, I'm not sure. Uh, why is that? But I think like the ductal cells from our previous uh work, uh, it looks like type one D might have some good proportion of uh ductal cells. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, uh, yeah, next uh, we, uh, so I cannot see the title. Yeah, so we uh, next um, identified uh, in which particular, so the same analysis, type 1D versus control, we used on different uh, cell types. Uh, but here we wanted to test where the autoantibody positive uh, group will fit in. So uh, here we can see, um, most of the autoantibody positive donors on the x-axis, almost nine donors. We checked uh, the distribution uh, that were classified as type 1D. So here, uh, HPAP92 had like almost 1200 cells in SNR. Uh, similarly, alpha cell, beta cell, uh, everywhere we checked. And uh, in general, among the uh, autoantibody positive uh, cells from the autoantibody positive donors, 10% of them were classified as type 1 D cells and almost 90% were just controls. So we wanted to know uh, where these 10% of cells that are being classified as type 1 D are coming from, uh, for example, which particular donor. Uh, so uh, we, um, we kind of uh, did the unannotated strategy. So we can see here, uh, that uh, most of the uh, one unannotated is where we use all the cells regardless of the cell types and check. So we ch when we checked that, we found that uh, HPAP92 is something uh, where uh, most of the cells were being classified as uh, type 1D, uh, although they were not uh, really type 1D. Uh, they were just autoantibody positive. So this was one of the important findings. So uh, I think I skipped this one. So here uh, we kind of checked in each, went in each cell type and checked the expression of HLA1 genes because we wanted to see uh, how they are uh, performing, uh, I mean, how they look like. So here we have four different groups, control autoantibody positive and misclassified autoantibody positive, which means those cells that are actually autoantibody positive, but they are being classified as type 1D. So, and also type 1D. So if you look at the expression of uh, these genes in the uh, in those cells that are classified as type 1D, uh, the expression level is almost similar uh, uh, across the board for actually A, B, C, E. Similarly in alpha cells as well, uh, the expression of those cells that were classified as, uh, those autoantibody cells that were classified as type 1D were similar. Um, and we also checked in the all cell types, that is regardless of the cell type, just checking everything. Uh, still uh, the 
cells that were classified as type 1D had high expression of HLA A, B, C, E. So um, this thing was also confirmed in the HPF92 donor. So uh, we checked the expression here uh, for all the uh, all these genes only in this particular donor, HPAP92, where the cells were classified as type 1D. And the expression matched with the type 1D uh, average expression for all these uh, all these marker genes. So um, as we can see in this plot, uh, is to show how how the classifier picked these genes. So on the y-axis, we have gene selection frequency, which means uh, how many times this particular gene uh, from HLA class one was being picked across 100 iteration on different classifiers. So on all these three classifiers, HLA A, B, C, E were almost picked 100 times. And we also checked a few of them uh, for HLA two, uh, which is known from the literature, uh, although it's not that relevant to I mean, I do not say it's not relevant, but may not be that uh, impactful in type 1D, but some of the, these are like commonly known. And uh, yeah, they were not that much picked. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we have non-HLA kind of genes, uh, which are well-known in the literature, insulin, nile 32 uh, All of these were uh, sort of picked by the classifier. So along with this uh, non um, HLA uh, genes, uh, we wanted to see if there is any inflammation profile that comes up uh, or uh, any kind of cytokines, chemokines. So apart from the IL-32, the only uh, gene that came up uh, in our list was CXL8 or IL-8. So if you look at this plot, uh, in the type 1D versus control classifier, uh, IL-8 was picked almost 100 times, actually 100 times. And then in the type 1D versus uh, autoantibody positive donor, uh, in this group, uh, IL-8 was picked almost uh, near to 60 times. And it was reduced in this uh, classifier. So the next question uh, we asked was, OK, this is in overall cell types. Next, we if we go down to the cell type level, uh, how is this performance? How does this performance looks like? And uh, so we can see here in type 1D versus control, most of them uh, in the SNR cell was almost uh, getting picked. And in the ductal cell population, type 1D versus autoantibody positive, uh, there was a lot of, uh, I mean, CXCL8 had a lot of uh, uh, expression and it was getting picked. So next we looked into the the expression at using these violin plots just to see the raw or normalized expression value uh, in across different groups. So we have control, autoantibody positive, and type 1D group. So here we can see uh, it's mostly in uh, ductal cells uh, and stellates uh, that uh, the, the expression is like high for CXL8 in autoantibody positive and type 1D. So if we look at this plot, most of the expression looks similar between these two groups for this particular gene. So uh, we we went into the autoantibody positive group because that's our interest. Uh, that's, that, that's where we wanted to know in which particular donor it is being, uh, it is having the expression. So it looks like uh, HPAP92 uh, had high expression of CXL8 compared to other groups. So this is the same donor, HPAP92, which was previously um, predicted to be diabetic. Most of the cells from that donor were predicted to be diabetic and type 1 diabetic. And uh, it was having high expression of CXL8. So we looked into the ductal cell group because ductal cell had uh, high uh, selection frequency in type 1D versus autoantibody positive. So we looked into the this group and uh, it looks like uh, in this particular donor, in ductal cells, uh, CXL expression, CXL8 uh, expression is higher compared to other groups. I think it's more similar to the type 1D in general. So this was one of the key findings. Uh, so now we wanted to see whether 
HPAP 92, um, this particular donor, is it some sort of uh, artifact or if it's real uh, that is predicted by the model? So we used a different strategy here that's called leave and out cross validation. So what we do here is we take uh, all the data into training set, leaving except one donor into the test set. So for example, here we take, if we consider this plot, all the 90% uh, of these donors will be taken into train and only one data will be one donor will be left out and it will be plugged as plugged in as a test set so uh, when we did that uh, across all different cell types we found that whenever we plugged in hpap 92 most of the cells were being predicted as type 1 diabetic uh, so uh, that was sort of uh, cross uh, confirmation that okay this particular donor was uh, classified as type 1 diabetic so in addition to uh, the this kind of validation, we also used uh, an independent uh, cohort that is again coming from HPAP. There were four new donors that were added, two type 1 diabetic and two controls. So uh, we used the entire previous data as a train set, and then we used uh, the this new uh, cohort as a test set, and then uh, checked the features, the top features that were predicted by our model previously, and the top features that are predicted by predicted on this validation data set. And uh, most of them uh, were confirmatory. Uh, so for example, top features predicted in alpha cells matched with FTR 0 0.01, which is significant. Same with immune or tectal cells. So next uh, we uh, used the top uh, markers, like actually A, B, C, and E and check the expression in this validation cohort. So it was still uh, high in type 1 diabetes, which matched with the previous observation. Similarly, for the non-HLF gene, uh, which was CXCL8, that was found to be uh, upregulated in type 1 diabetic uh, in ductal cells. We checked in this cohort, uh, uh, validation cohort, and uh, saw that it's uh, it, it, it sort of matches with the previous findings. So, uh, in summary, uh, we found that uh, most of the HLA-1 uh, or uh, non-HLA genes such as CXL8 uh, expression match between those uh, autoantibody positive cells that were classified as uh, type 1 diabetic, especially coming from uh, uh, HPAP92, uh, this particular donor. So, uh, our method uh, is, 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 is sort of a combination of gene selection and classification because we are using this uh, powerful uh, method called XGBoost, uh, which uses gradient, uh, I mean, uh, which is sort of a uh, decision trees. Uh, and it is the first attempt uh, to manifest uh, the higher expression of HLA1 or uh, CXL8 from autoantibody positive and type 1D donors. Uh, in the largest available data set. So there are some uh, limitations of this study. Uh, for example, uh, most of the uh, models take large amount of computational time and resources, uh, uh, considering the high dimensional nature of the data with almost 200,000 cells and uh, 50 different donors and different pairwise comparisons. So it's computationally intensive. And the biomarkers we identified uh, could not be tested uh, because of the cross-sectional nature of the study since human pancreas cannot be safely, uh, I mean, cannot be biopsied safely. And uh, yeah, this paper is published in uh, back in April in Cell Reports Medicine. And uh, thank all my uh, collaborators from uh, UPenn, uh, Dr. Naji, and Dr. Kastner's lab, and Dr. Faryadi's lab, and uh, yeah. Thank you, Abjit. This is a great paper, really exciting. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I want to also open it up to people in the audience. If someone has a question, please uh, either raise your hand or unmute yourself or drop something in the chat. Uh, I see Mike Demore is on here. I don't know if he had anything to ask about the model. Oh, well done. I I get it. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, I had a quick question for you, Abjit. You know, the CXCL8 access, um, 
sort of in context of oncology, you, know, you probably know this from your background, promotes invasiveness and angiogenesis in pancreatic ductal cells in an oncology setting. So what, what do you think about, you know, what's happening here in this setting? Do you have a hypothesis? Uh, actually, there was a paper uh, that was published recently. We, we, when we found this, we looked into the literature, if there is any uh, papers that are published, especially for the IL-8. Uh, there is a, a, a paper that, that says uh, IL-2 may be helpful in finding the new endotype for type 1 diabetes. Uh, I might have it something here. Uh, yeah, throw it in the chat if you're... If you if you can find it quickly, yeah. Let me. Uh... Um, I also wondered about while well, you're looking for that. Um, so what about you know, um those who are presenting sort of with the insulin, 923 hybrid first, or other, you know, zinc 2A or uh, T8 or any other sort of autoantibodies outside of what you looked at. Is that sort of next steps for you guys, or is, are there other data sets that have been looked at in that context? Uh, I think this this was just uh, GAD uh, positive donors uh, that we looked just into. Good. But do you have available, you know, the other collections or the other? No, no I think ILET antigen and uh, GAD uh, are the two uh, two uh, groups. That they if have I'm... in HPAP? Yeah. Okay, that great. They have in HPAP. Uh, probably there might be uh, more, but um, yeah, I'm not sure right now. <laughs> I am yeah. actually, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not in pen anymore. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> uh, I'm in a pharmaceutical company uh, since uh, 2022. Uh, yeah, since oh, two wow. years or more. Yeah, I'm, I'm working as a principal data scientist in the AI and data science group supporting immunology and neurology assets. Oh, okay, great. What's that company just so? Uh, it's uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals. Okay, great. Um, you know, with the HG Boost data, um, you know, do you feel like this is a, a great tool, a great machine learning tool to kind of further um, understanding of the HPAP data set? Uh, yeah. Or, you know, was it, you know, what were the pros and cons of it? So we actually, I mean, uh, whenever we have any new data, we uh, sort of uh, test with different method methods. So let me go to this slide. Yeah, so here, for example, we tested several methods like uh, support vector machine linear, support vector machine radial, naive base, uh, and random forest and other methodologies. Uh, but uh, none of them actually performed um, better compared to XGBoost. Uh, that was one thing. And also some of these methods, for example, SVM, naive base, or random, random forest gives like the feature ranking, but these doesn't provide like the feature ranking, which means they won't provide a list of uh, significant genes. Uh, so uh, with the lack of uh, performance and uh, in the absence of features, which is very important for us, uh, we proceeded with XGBoost. Uh, and also the XGBoost has been widely used in single cell uh, field, especially for annotations and uh, different applications uh, in general for transcriptomics data. Uh, so that was one other uh, main reasoning to uh, use this approach. Okay, last question. Do you think, uh, in your opinion, would a community sort of hackathon into existing data sets, HPAP and others, um, you know, using your, your model here, um, do you think that would be useful? Um, if you had more hands on deck, basically, sort of like, you know, performing these types of inquiries into pre-existing data sets? Yeah, I think it's just like uh, most of the uh, uh, hackathons or I mean, these kind of things happen in a small uh, data set. This is like kind of too uh, large of a data set. And uh, yeah, like it, it, it potentially would, could increase a lot of uh, accuracy in terms of accuracy and everything, but the main caveat would be like, uh, the computational sources 
that mm-hmm. needed to run this model are not enough. I mean, I was lucky enough to have <laughs> the, that infrastructure in Vaidhi's uh, lab, Dr. Vaidhi's lab. So, yeah, uh, but if there is like enough computational resources, yes, I think uh, anyone could apply these models and yeah. Good, okay, well, that's a, that's, that's a good vote of confidence. We'll keep that in mind um, as we move forward in the sugar science and thinking about other data-driven um, community builds and competitions that we're, we're um, considering. Thank you again, Abjit. It was great, um, great paper and um, great to hear you're doing well. And uh, thanks for sharing the work with us. Thank we'll you talk so again much. soon. Yeah, thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks,